This is the Biz News Podcast, one-on-one conversations with experts in business and personal development. Watch it. Your brain may be about to fool you. So says Melina Palmer, founder and CEO of The Brainy Business, which provides behavioral economics consulting to businesses. Understanding the tricks of the brain can help consumers as well as those selling to consumers, she says. Melina Palmer joins us for this untricky Biz News interview podcast. You have uh, written uh, two books, one entitled What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You, and another one coming out this fall, What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You. What do you mean they can't tell us? We're listening, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, Even if we're listening, our brains don't really, uh, you know, we have brains, we don't really know how they work intuitively. And uh, as you know, we like to think about what people should do. We all know that we should exercise and eat right. And yet we find ourselves, you know, binge watching Netflix and eating Cheetos on Friday night or whatever that is. Right. So um, our, our brains don't work the way that we think they should. So even if people would like to tell you, they often don't know what they would really like to do. Okay. So as we get into this, we need to uh, prepare the ground for our listeners and viewers. Tell them a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so my name is Melina Palmer. I am an applied behavioral economist, and I have a background in um, business, brand strategy, marketing. I worked in corporate uh, for about 10 years before uh, doing this full time, where I do speaking and consulting and have my own podcast and things, Uh, but helping people to understand what's really going on in the brain, why people do the things they do, why they buy the things they buy, how we really react to change and how habits work and all that sort of fun stuff. It's sort of like uh, being the mechanic of an Indy 500 racer, right? Uh, yes, I feel like <laughs> other than my, my complete lack of knowledge of anything further than that, that conceptually, I would say, yes, <laughs> don't ask any deeper questions than that. And I can say, yes, <laughs> I, I see. Okay. Well, one of the things you have said along the way over the years is that how a person says something seems to matter more than what they're actually saying. Would you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So that's a concept called framing. And this best, my favorite example for this is just to imagine that you're going to the grocery store uh, because today, you know, you're going to make spaghetti for dinner. You need to buy some ground beef. And so you get to the store. There are two stacks that are almost identical. One is labeled as 90% fat free and the one next to it as 10% fat. And which one feels just more appealing? Which one would you rather buy? Well, they're so, identical, are they not? <laughs> they are. Yet most people, and I have talked around about this, given this example to thousands of people around the world, and overwhelmingly people prefer 90% fat free. It sounds better, it feels better to us in the way that we hear that information versus 10% fat. You start to think about how, uh, like, where's that going to go? It doesn't feel healthy like 90% fat free does. We logically know that they're the same thing, uh, but you're really drawn toward one. This has also been done in studies where uh, when doctors are told that a medical procedure has an 85% success rate, they're much more likely to recommend it than when they're told it has a 15% mortality rate. So people have a hard time with basic math. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you know, framing is more than just math and numbers, but those are some pretty simple examples uh, to be able to showcase that. I also like to give the example of, uh, say, if versus when. Uh, We tend to say if a lot. So if you have questions, let me know. If you're interested, give me a call. Instead, when you can say when, when you're ready, here's the next step. It has this implied endorsement that something is going to be happening. It feels different, even though it's often very similar. So words matter when you come right down to it. Uh, When you came across that in your early career, were you surprised? 
You know, it, there's some of it that's intuitive to me. And then I've come back around on the back, you know, like back end and learning the concepts and saying, oh, that's why I did that. And so there are lots of things that I think have worked. Uh, but that being said, yes, I think even the extent and depth to which they matter is surprising. And every study I find is so fascinating. I love reading up on all of these things. So, uh, and across all the concepts of the behavioral sciences, it's, it's always really amazing to learn more about our brains. You, you must be the world's best consumer with all of this knowledge. <laughs> uh, it would be great to say that we never fall victim to any of our brain's little tricks uh, once we know about them. Uh, but really the brain, so humans make on average 35,000 decisions every single day, every person, 35,000 decisions. That's a lot. And we can't consciously process all of that information because we wouldn't get anything done. And we need to have our subconscious processing doing a lot of the things because it's able to work so much faster and uh, streamline through things. So it uses these rules of thumb to make decisions like that framing choice to say, that one sounds better. Let's go that way. Right. Uh, so we have to rely on that because our brains would actually just use up too much energy. We couldn't consume enough calories to make all those decisions on a conscious level. And so we need that subconscious processing. So I, I too <laughs> fall victim to things though, uh, that being my own brain, right. Victim to my brain versus, um, but I guess I, I often will say, I know that this is anchoring or this is a frame, but I still want it. Right. I, I <laughs> Let me uh, go back to one other thing you have said in the past. And that is we seem to think that less available, i.e. scarcity means more value. Not necessarily true, correct? Yeah. So it is true that our brains feel that way, uh, that when something is scarce, that it has more value. Uh, but often it isn't, I guess, uh, necessarily. I, I like to give the example of, um, you know, you think about collecting something like stamps. And uh, a lot of people will collect a stamp. And it's, this one's really rare because it's the only one or it had a misprint on it. Um, but it's still, I mean, a sticky piece of paper at the end of the day. Right? <laughs> so it only has value because other people think that it's valuable because there's less of it. Um, definitely. We've seen a lot in you know, cryptocurrencies and NFTs and all of that that's happening these days. Uh, but there've been bubbles all the way back to tulip bulbs and all that. So we, we do this again and again and again, beanie babies, you know, whatever it is, the, um, the Virgin Mary grilled cheese sandwich, right? <laughs> uh, is, is it because humans aren't really as smart as we'd like to think we are? In some ways, sure. Yeah, I think we are smarter than we think in many ways. And we are, you know, not as smart maybe as we think in lots of others. <laughs> what is in, in terms of all that you have uh, done over the years in research and presenting and uh, delving into this has surprised you the most and changed your career the most? I think just the knowledge of how our brains really make decisions and knowing the that behavioral economics even exists. So when I did my undergrad, uh, which was in business administration, I had a focus in marketing. And there was one class that had a little bit about uh, buying psychology and why people did the things they did. And I thought it was amazing and that I wanted to go learn more about it uh, and get a master's in it, but there weren't programs. And I called for 10 years, different schools asking about it. And they said it didn't exist. It wasn't an option. And then I was in this innovation program, met some people from what's called the center for advanced hindsight at Duke university. That's their behavioral economics department. And they were talking about the research and the work that they did. And I knew it was what I was looking for and finding out more and more about the brain and, and researching and getting my own master's in behavioral economics uh, has just really changed the way that I 
think about everything and approach any problems or 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 anything. Yeah. How has that uh, affected your business and how you operate? Well, I would say that my business, uh, so I end every episode of my podcast and I have my you know, email signature line is be thoughtful, B-E being in capital letters for behavioral economics, kind of a play on words there. Uh, so thoughtfulness is something I've always cared about, but it's, it's thoughtfulness toward other people and also just looking more at, you know, why did I do this thing? You know, questioning my own brain more often than I ever really did. And, and other people and the decisions that they have made. So like when you walk through a grocery store and you see something on a shelf to say, I wonder why that's on that shelf. Did they put it next to this for a specific reason or does it just happen to be there? And if I was to put it somewhere else, how might that change the way people buy? Just being a curious questioner, I think, and not just accepting the choices my brain is making all the time. Is, is this uh, some form of, of uh, trickery? No. Uh, so it is common to get questions about ethics when we're talking about the way that we present information. I think that Thaler and Sunstein, who wrote a book called Nudge, uh, and Richard Thaler actually won the Nobel Prize uh, for economics in, I think, 2017, uh, in talking about uh, behavioral economics and this concept of nudging. And they say that really, when we're looking at a nudge, it's a way that everyone still has free choice to make a decision. And they also work in this area called choice architecture, which is what we do within the behavioral sciences. So the way you present a choice makes a difference in the choice that someone will make. Uh, an example they give in their book is saying in a cafeteria, if you had you know kids loose in the cafeteria, they can get anything they want. Their parents will never know. They're probably, we're thinking they're just getting French fries and ice cream and, you know, no good stuff. But what they find is that when you put something towards the front of the line, uh, so when desserts were at the front, they were 25% more likely to be chosen. When they were at the back of the line or in a completely separate line, they were 25% less likely to be chosen. And when you have something at eye level, whether it's French fries or carrot sticks, you know, it's 25, it's much more likely to be chosen. And so where you place something makes a difference on what it is that we choose. You could still get the desserts. They're not banned from you, uh, but you have the option to make the choice and things feel more appealing based on how they're presented. So whether you think about it or not, the way you're presenting choices is impacting the decision someone else makes. And so really, I think it's better to be thoughtful about it. How we have to ask this question because we have been asking it now for the last two years of everybody we have interviewed, I believe. How has COVID affected your business? Well, for me, my business was really set up to, I had a lot of speaking engagements and in-person events <laughs> scheduled for 2020, as did many others, and had to pivot really quickly in that way. It worked out well for me in that I had a busy summer planned that then turned into some opportunity to write that first book. And so I got to sit out on my back deck in the mostly sunshine, like we we're saying, I live in Washington state, so not too sunny all the time here, <laughs> uh, but, and, and write that first book and have the, the space to really get that done and pivoting to focus on virtual events. And there are a lot of businesses I've been able to connect with from around the world, an interview for my podcast or, or for the book or, or work on projects with that I don't know that I ever really would have had that chance because everyone had to kind of slow down and be more open to that virtual space. So while I think, you know, we always say wish it hadn't happened, of course, and I, I'm always looking for that kind of silver lining and things. So what is ahead for you? Well, as you said, my second book is coming out here in the fall. Uh, so what your customer wants and can't tell you the first book is about oh, that. Yes. And what, what exactly is that, by the way? <laughs> uh, many things. It's all of what we've been talking about, right? Uh, so it's uh, that that is about 
um, branding and working with customers, consumers, members, whatever it is that you have, and understanding that the way you present information makes a difference. The um, framework that I use for pricing strategy and, and all of that, I also use the same exact thing for change management, because whether you exchange money or not, you know, you're selling someone on an idea you need them to buy in on, even if there's not that physical currency that's changing hands. And so the second book, What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You, uh, has its subtitle of Adapting uh, to the Sci- to Change with the Science of Behavioral Economics, I think is, is where the publishers landed with that. It's not fully out yet. But really, it's about being a better manager, leading people through change, understanding how our brains work in uh, when we're presented with a change, uh, that change is not just in these really big, massive moments, uh, but small changes can impact our brains very significantly. And so focusing on that can help to get everything to be more efficient, kind of a tortoise in the hare sort of a, a process uh, for businesses. And so I'm going to be doing a lot with change over the next, uh, I will say foreseeable future, but I'm, I'm excited about helping people to have better experiences at work. Now, where can our listeners and viewers get more information? We know you have a website. Would you tell them what it is? Of course. Yes. It's the brainy business.com. And there you can find the books and the podcast. You can also find me on all the socials as the brainy biz B I Z. What would you like to uh, tell our audiences that we haven't talked about? Oh, well, um, just to, I, I, you know, I've already talked about being thoughtful, which is sort of where I always uh, end in this sort of thing. So I would say just take a moment. Our brains are uh, kind of wired to think we're going to do something tomorrow or next week or Monday, right? So you're going to start that new diet on Monday. You're going to implement the things you learned about on the podcast on Monday. And then Monday comes and we get wrapped up in all of our old stuff. And, you know, Monday never really comes. And so that is due to a concept that's called hyperbolic time discounting, which is a a lovely name for it. I call it the all start Monday effect. Uh, That when we think about ourselves in the future, we actually see ourselves, our brain lights up as if we're thinking and talking about a completely different person. And so it's really easy to commit future Melina to get up at 5 a.m. and run or just drink uh, water and have you know plain salad or whatever. Uh, but then when I'm presented with those things, it doesn't feel as appealing. So anything that you can be doing in this moment, if there's one thing you can go do, you heard me talk about framing, or you were thinking about something with habits and you want to change something, do one little thing right now to help your brain to see that it's important. Take that first step and it will make it that you're more likely to then follow through. You've been watching the Biz News Podcast. We welcome your input. Send your email to editor at biznews.com. Thanks for watching.